mic over to Thor since he has the first question for this. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's a very interesting uh, question, and I, I definitely want to ask about that later on in the video. But getting back to the subject of the underworld, as opposed to like other afterlives and, and the different mythologies, different beliefs, what makes an underworld an underworld? You spoke a little bit about this river or body of water and, and even a tree, but is, is what kinds of things associated with the underworld are, are always there in, in whichever culture we're talking about? Well, the underworld is generally always associated with the dead. Certainly in Indo-European religions, it's always associated with the dead. But uh, this idea of a tiered cosmos with three principal things is shared with the Native American Siberian religion. So it must be of ancient North Eurasian provenance. And it's familiar to any Christians because they've got heaven, earth, and hell. Well, like the same basic principle applies for most uh, Indo-European and the religions and, and na many Native Americans one too, where there's this world, the Middle Earth, which has within it strange places that are not exactly seen. Like there are things in this Middle Earth, including like the dwarves or that can dwell within the rocks or like whites or whatever you want to call like entities that dwell within this world that aren't fully seen. And Jürgenheim, although like you can see these these starting from the Victorian times onwards, like people drawing trees with little branches with different worlds coming on, like to show Norse cosmology. They're not really representative. And Jotunheim is a bit of a hard one to really fit in because a lot of the time, Jotun, what's been called Jotunheim is really conflated with the underworld. And other times, Jotunheim is very clearly referring to something in the middle world, our world, which is outside the world of men. So the Jotun, Jotunar dwell where men don't. So at the edge of the world of men is where the Jotuns come. But also sometimes they're associated with the underworld. So Jotunheim as this distinct separate world from the world of the men, the underworld and the gods is a little bit of a misnomer in my opinion. But the underworld is a place for the most part where the dead go. And it's at the roots of the world tree, although not all Indo-European religions specify that it's at the roots, but some of them specify there is a tree within it. The tree is associated very much with the underworld in all of them, but within the, the, the Germanic tradition, the Norse tradition, it's under the roots. The general associations of hell, there's lots of water there, there's lots of, there's lots of halls there, like El Yuthnir, it's hell, the woman's hall. Uh, and there's also like a horrible, there's a, a, one of the rivers has a bank called uh, Nordstrand, which is a, a place where the, the bad guys go and get punished by Nitho, the big snake. Uh, and there's also a, 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 a hall there. And that hall has, is made up of snakes. It's got snakes in the roof and stuff and they drip venom on uh, bad guys who go in there. So there's some halls, there's many halls in hell. And um, my opinion is, I'll come to this later if you want, uh, that Valhall is in hell, not in Asgard, but uh, I, that's another thing. But the version of the cosmology of Germanics is in a way is simplified because I think like it became, in the, in the sources we have, they've like put them on different places where they're not associated with the underworld when they were before. And I can elaborate on that if you like. Yeah, that's I, that's awesome, and I've actually never even thought about that. That's completely yeah, yeah, good, good. Thank you for that idea. Now, it's a lot of things are tying up this idea of associating like rivers or bodies of waters with hell. It could be like most of them in the mythology and sources that we read that, and also we know how people were, you know, sent out to sea on a ship, or they were buried a lot of burials right next to lakes and rivers like you said with the weapons there too and also the the lakes especially in, in scandinavian folk tradition later on in time were said to be a place where the dead were or some harmful spirits were so it's it all ties up um but what uh it kind of leads on to my next question what kind of can funeral or burial practices influence this journey to the afterlife or underworld? Of course, with the ship burials and ship cremations, pretty clear that they that would accompany you to the afterlife to maybe make that trip across the river easier. But are there any other things, uh, maybe burial or funeral practice evidence that's, that kind of facilitated that journey to the underworld that we know of? Sure, well, when it comes to cremation, that's something that goes back, you know, into prehistory, long, long prehistory, uh, and comes in and out of fashion. Um, the early Indo-Europeans didn't cremate, but some of the Neolithic Europeans did. 
And it seems like as they integrated more, like the two things became like the barrows and inter internments of Indo-Europeans and the cremations of non-Indo-Europeans get mixed in different ways. But in Ibn Fadlan's account, he asks an Arab, the Arab asks a Viking why they're burning the dead. And he says something like, you Arabs are fools because you, uh, you know, bury the dead and let them be eaten by worms. Whereas we burn them up in an instant. So they instantly attain paradise using the Arabic translation paradise. So is it meaning some kind of a heaven? So like it, in that, if that account is to be believed, then the purpose of cremation from the Germanic perspective was to speed up the journey. It was saying you get the, help the guy get there quicker, uh, and the faster the, the the higher the flames, the better. So that that um, sounds plausible to me. The boat thing does not begin with the ship burial tradition because we have the stone boats going all the way back to the Nordic Bronze Age. So the stone boats continue all the way into the end of the Viking era. So that's one of the most um, long lived like religious traditions of uh, Scandinavia because it survived from the Nordic Bronze Age, where most practice from the Nordic Bronze Age didn't. Uh, and I speculated in my video on that, that 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 actually is the reflects a different meaning. The original function of the boat had some kind of, because these stone boats aren't consistently associated with funerals. They are sometimes, but they're not exclusively, and they're just as much Always used someone as, buried there, right? Yeah. And Sometimes for the people, people will maybe them. put an image up here on the video, the stone, uh, you know, boats he's talking about. It's like uh, flat land and the, there are basically stones like stacked around whatever burial sites um, in, in the shape of a ship. They, uh, yeah, they're often in burial mounds. So I think they should be associated with, um, with the dead. Uh, they're not always in, in, in burial grounds. But they usually are. And they appear to have... I think initially some solar associations which of the Nordic Bronze Age cult, but later not so much and more about us, uh, more likely to have some relation to uh, the cult of maybe the cult of Vanir, specifically Freya and her whole Ses Rumnir, which um, uh, she has her, a separate afterlife, which I don't think is in hell, Folkfang, Folkfang, it could be, but uh, it, it does seem like this. Most Indo-European religions have some conception of a heaven, which is seen as a green, verdant place. And in the Ibn Fadlan account, I was just uh, Garrett was just asking about that. They when they lift up the slave girl who they sacrifice at the funeral, she says, "I see paradise." Translated again, paradise uh, as as the other Viking guy said to Ibn, uh, which is like their word for heaven. But it's paradise and it's verdant and green. And this is like the Elysian fields in Greek myth. And like, there's many other examples I've given in my video of like different Indo-European notions of a field, a meadow, beautiful meadow where people go when they're dead or like good, some good people go. And Folkvang means people field. Uh, and it's cognate with uh, Anglo-Saxon afterlife called Neorksnawang. And Wang and Vang, it's the same thing, it's field. Neorksna, I'm not sure on the etymology, but it could mean corpse field, uh, in which case it doesn't sound so nice, but the the idea is that uh, based on the fact that there's a, a list of of names of different famous ships, uh, Athula is a, an edic list of names of ships, including Noah's Ark and things like that. It mentions Sesrumnir as a ship, which is also elsewhere called Freya's Hall in Folkvang. But so is her hall actually a ship in a field? Well, that's what we see. These stone boats are like ships in fields. So maybe that was like some kind of association with her. Uh, it does seem plausible. Um, so, and then the barrow is, which is also of Indo-European origin, is called in one kenning Dauthradura and is frequently in different sources, a gate of hell. It's a gateway. Dauthradura means doors of the dead, but it's also called the gateway to hell. So the barrow is somewhere where not only the dead enter hell, but where the dead can come back and, and where you, as a living man, can converse with the dead. You can go there and receive divine visions in your dreams if you sleep on top of a barrow, or if you, you know the right gaulder, the right songs, you can converse with the dead uh, awake or, or interact with them and extract wisdom from them. And the, the barrow in the Norse sources is, is confusing because it's not really, it's almost conflated with hell. And in, in a way, many of the main principal like 
the scriptures that we by, by which we identify hell, which is that it's cold, it's wet, and it's got snakes in it. Those are all true for barrows as well. And barrows, uh, like if I dig in my garden, I get these things called slow worms, and they're like one of three reptiles uh, that could be called a worm in Northern Europe. The other two are the grass snake, which is sacred in Lithuanian paganism, for example, the adder, which is specifically associated with Woden in the Anglo-Saxon charm, the nine herb charm, so nine herbs charm, and the uh, slow worm, as we call it, which is actually a lizard that has no legs, so it looks like a snake, but um, it's called a copper orm in Swedish. I, I don't know what it's called in Nor Norwegian, but they live underground, and when you dig a hole, they're, they're there. So whenever you were digging a grave, you would see these things wriggling around, and so they would associate them, they associated in, in other Indo-European religions as well, including in India, the underworld is associated with snakes. And I think that in a lot of the imagery that they used to describe hell is also poetically describing the interior of a barrow or the grave. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and they're like, the world of hell is kind of imagined somehow as being the, the accumulative interiors of all the barrows or something like that. It's hard to understand with like our modern conceptions of space and and uh, and like physical space but i think that that's something that they conceived of yeah that is another thing i, I never thought about either thank you again for that it's with this especially with the snakes and it's uh, it goes back to this idea of um kind of animism and sympathetic magic that I always speak about. It's like, it's not just they're referring to hell as the one burial mound or grave there. It's like all of them collectively, the energy that is in those burial mounds collectively. So that's really, uh, really interesting. And thank you for, yeah, it brings up some more ideas. Um, people will ask uh, the next question. It sounds kind of a uh, kind of basic and maybe we don't have so much sources for it but what was the underworld like for the dead um there might be some things about it but people who actually do follow these beliefs like i do um they're, they're gonna want to know this how they would spend their afterlife so what do we know about what the underworld is like for the dead is it pleasant unpleasant are there things activities events that are happening or any types of common things that we know about that um, yeah, well, it's hard, it's a bit conflicting in the sources. Um, like, <clears throat> definitely the idea of being around snakes is not good in their mm. worldview. Like, they might not always think of snakes as being a bad thing. Like, it's not universally like snake equals evil, like in the Christian symbology, but it certainly isn't something you want to do to be in a snake pit, like Gunnar in the story where he gets thrown into a snake pit. And the snake pit is kind of like a metaphor for the hell in my, in my opinion, like, because it's like, uh, you know, it happens to um, Ragnar Lofbrok as well. Like it's not a good place, it's not a good way to die in a pit full of snakes. But um, the, the way that hell is associated with snakes therefore, or the, specifically the bad part of hell is especially associated with snakes. Mm. Uh, that makes me think it's a bad place. And it's not just like you have in the Norse sources, I mentioned already, you've got um, uh, Norstrand, where like there's the, the hall where people are taught like drip venom from snakes and stuff like that. But like in the Anglo-Saxon sources, which as an Englishman, that's like, they're quite important for me. There is, for example, in the poem Judith, it, it talks about Wurmsela and elsewhere it says Wurmjeer. So Wurmsela means the snake hall and that probably refers to the same place as uh, at Nostrand and Wurmjeer, which is like the, the worm place, the worm enclosure, which may refer to the entirety of hell itself. So I think that like, in that perspective, we should definitely think of it as being negative, uh, but elsewhere it's like, is it really that bad? Because people are, when Boulder dies, he's having a feast. And when other people also are like, um, Okay, so other, other negative things like hell, hell owns things like her hall, Eljuthnir, means storm increaser. So that sounds bad. Her plate is called, it means her name of her plate is hunger. It's like the worst thing to call a plate. And not, her knife is called starvation. So like, her, and her threshold is called falling pit. It's, and like some other Indo-European 
like uh, notions of the underworld and of the woman of the underworld, the goddess of the underworld is like, she, you fall into a pit and she pulls you down with these cores and hell has these hellia rape, it's talked about like the ropes of hell she uses to pull you down. So it's like a falling thing that, that all sounds very bad. So in the, I wouldn't say hell is good, but then like, as I said, Boulder has a feast. Some people even farm there. The people who are there are able to enjoy food and drink. They drink alcohol, some of them at least. And there's not just El Yithner, that that's probably a bad hall, or maybe it's not the worst. Nostrand is the worst hall, but I think they're probably nice halls. And my opinion, as I mentioned before, Val Hall is in hell. And I've got a few ways of justifying that. Like in Gisli Saga, it says it's the custom to put hell shoes on someone who's going to walk to Val Hall. So specifically, you have to wear the hell shoes to get to Val Hall. Like it's a very clear association. And in Saxo Grammaticus' account of uh, Haddingus' journey to hell, uh, it says, after crossing the river of weapons, when well, you got that mentioned that thing earlier, that co corresponds to hell, the river of weapons is in hell, Slither, uh, in, in, the, in the Icelandic source. So the Danish guy is reinforcing that. And after that river, he, he, you see two armies engaged in a conflict, which the a woman who is a psychopomp declares to be unending a battle in hell of two armies that never ends. It's exactly the same as the edict description of what happens at Val Hall. The guys just fight all day and then they come back to life and then they go have a drink or whatever. That, I really think Val Hall, and as I said also, Odin is in, uh, Odin is a ferryman in hell in several sources. That's like his job. So I think Val Hall is one of the good places in hell, uh, actually. Uh, and everyone goes to hell to start with, like even Boulder goes to hell to start with. And some people go up to a kind of meadow like Folkvang. Uh, I'm not clear exactly what criteria qualifies one to go there, but I know what qualifies one to enter Valhall because it, they tell us that you have to be a warrior. Uh, if you die, as you live and die as a warrior in life, then you go and in hell, you go to the hall where the warriors go. But, uh, and if you behave like a son of a bitch, then you go to Nordstrand. Mm. So uh, I'm sure there are all kinds of other halls that we don't know about, which were appropriate destinations in hell. Some of them very nice, some of them all right, and some of them very horrible. Uh, but that's my short 